welcome to the last talk of the day. So um, I hope this one going to be an exciting one. So um, I'm going to talk about a new open source project called Moxing. You know, it's uh, in Chinese it's called Moxing. It means a uh, model, an AI model. So my name is Michael Yuan, and uh, I'm the founder of the, another open source project called WaterMatch, which is a WebAssembly project with CNCF. But um, Moxing is one of the um, projects that I was uh, involved in, right? So um, since this is an um, uh, AI event in Linux Foundation, so you know, so I think it goes without saying that I guess everybody knows that's uh, uh, the importance of uh, open source AI or open weight AI, right? You know, so um, one of the questions I always got is that okay, so there's benefits in privacy, there are benefits in you know customization, fine tuning, and all that. But what about the raw performance? Isn't the open source stuff that's Lacking, you know, when it's compared with, say, you know, um, um, as a hosted, the SaaS based solution and, you know, things like that. So I always show them this diagram, you know. So the top line is really the, the um, well, the left, um, you know, the y axis is uh, a score at MMLU, which is one of the, um, you know, uh, a test that measures model intelligence. The, you know, the X is, uh, is a time. And you can see that uh, the top line is the evolution of the closed source AI. As you can see, they are generally performing better. And the green dots and the line underneath was the uh, evolution of the open source AI or open weights AI. Right? You know, so you can see it's, uh, the intersection going to happen. Some may say it's already happened. You know, uh, sometime this year, but of course, GPT-5 may get released later this year. So the open, uh, the closed source one may go up another step, may not, right? You know, so we are look, uh, we are looking at uh, 500 billion parameter models from Meta and from Nvidia as well, and they do exceptionally well. So that's you know, I often show people this diagram. That's the compelling reason why you should care about or thinking about running. Uh, open ways or open source AI in your own hardware. You know, it's that not only it has a lot of benefit in terms of agent, in terms of customization, fine tuning, uh, with you know uh, the, the special pump you might dis uh, you might did, uh, you might you might deliver, uh, develop on your own, but it's also in terms of the raw performance, it's also catching up, right? So um, maybe this is a good time to do a little uh, advertisement. So tomorrow morning there's a keynote. You know, so I'm gonna uh, go on stage with uh, with the CTO of Docker. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about, um, you know, because when you run closed source AI, there's, uh, when you run open source, open weight AI, there's several challenges. One of the challenges is what we're going to talk about in this talk is to run it locally. The other one is to run in Docker, you know, is that the po po people talk about the impossible triangle of the GPU, large language model, and Docker. You, know, you can't have all three of them together. You know, that's, uh, but things are changing. So um, tomorrow there'll be a keynote speech that's, uh, that's specifically about that with work that has been done by the, the, uh, the WasmH team and Docker team. But anyway, so that's you know, um, why we want to do that. So the project I want to talk about is really um, is called Moshing, like, uh, like I talked, you know, the, uh, this is a GitHub link. And uh, so uh, I want to start this talk by giving you uh, uh, a demo. You know, so uh, last night the team worked really hard. You know, that um, made a release that we now have an installer for the Mac. So if you have a computer open, that you could you could just download it and and, and try it with me. And uh, um, you, you know, if you are using desktop Linux, there's also a link for that. So let me go to open up the application I've installed on the Mac. So. At first, you can see there's a, a discovery tab. That's it allows you to go to you know to browse those models. So for instance, I can I can search for it, right? You know, so if I can search for it by keyword, so you know that's one of the models that Alibaba has released, right? You know, so it goes to a database and search for those model, and you can uh, open it up and see the uh, files that are available. You know, so those files are. Uh, quantized versions of this model, right? You know, so you could have, say, depending on how much memory you have, you could choose a, uh, you, you could choose a larger version or a smaller version. So because this is all on your computer, on your own computer, so you can try those, right? So there's um, um so, you know, here in this tab, you can, you can, um, you can find the model and then you can download it. Once you download it, you can chat with it. So you can see I have downloaded two models. 
One is what um, the first is what everybody is really familiar with. It's uh, Lama 3 uh, 8B model. And the other one is uh, um, a QN uh, 1.8 billion parameter model. So one is smaller, one is larger, right? So um, with those models downloaded, you can go to chat with it. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to turn off Wi-Fi on this computer, OK? So just to show you that everything works offline, because I have downloaded this model, and I'm going to uh, ask it questions. And so you know, um, just to make absolutely sure, it, I'm not asking ChatGPT or anything else. So I'm going to ask, say, where is Paris? Since we are in Paris, right? You know, so the model gonna think about it, and you can see this whole thing works off my computer. This computer, I have no external um, power source attached to it. I bought this computer two years ago when the company asked, you know, how much memory do you need on this computer? I said, I just want the simplest computer that you can cheapest MacBook you can you can possibly find, right? Because I was thinking about I'm gonna do most of my coding on. GitHub Copilot and um, you know, uh, you know, on those online editors and you know things like that. But little do I know that two years later, this becomes Mac has become the most cost-effective way to run a large language model. I recently bought another Mac that is uh, um, that's um, I, I put that in my office in Singapore. You know, it's a Mac Studio. It has almost 200 gigabytes of uh, of memory, and so I can run a fairly large model on it. It's cost about $5,000, which sounds a lot, but if you think about the NVIDIA card, one NVIDIA card gonna cost you five times that, right? You know, so it is one of the most cost efficient ways to run large language models these days. But anyway, coming back to how much memory I have on this machine, I only have 16 gigabytes of memory on this machine. It was bought two years ago. It was a M1 machine, and uh, you know, it's a, uh, um, it has no internet, and uh, as you can see, I just turn off internet, right? You know, so but I can run a large language model, and I can ask it, you know, where's Paris? It gives a, you know, I wouldn't say a very comprehensive answer, but it's an okay answer, right? You know, so what I'm going to ask is a more challenging question, because I come because I live in Texas. There's a, if you guys know, there's a famous movie called Paris in Texas, right? So there's a town called Paris in Texas. So I'm gonna ask what about the one in Texas, okay? So you, you can see the, the result come back instantly, even on this machine. And uh, you can see it doesn't answer very well. So, you, you know, um, I know it's maybe hard to, to read at the, at, um, uh, at the end of the room. So at the top, when I said where is Paris, it said Paris is the capital city of France, located in the northern part of the country on the Seine River and surrounded by several major cities, whatever. And then the second one, I said, what about the one in Texas? It said the capital city of Texas is Austin. It's located in the central part of the state on the Colorado River and surrounded by XYZ. You know, so it mirrors the reply from the top, but it didn't answer my question. What about the one in Paris, the, in Texas? I didn't mean the, the capital in Texas, I mean the Paris in Texas, right? So could a larger model help me with that? So let me open another conversation. And instead of using the uh, QN model, which is only 1.5 um, billion parameters, let me switch to the Llama 3 model with 8 billion parameters and ask the same question. You say, if I say, where is Paris? And you can see this model responds um, uh, slower because, but it's still pretty reasonable speed, even on you know it's on, on a two-year-old consumer laptop, and it it gives more concise answers. It says Paris is the capital of France, located in Western Europe. Okay, so if I ask, what, what about the one in Texas? I think there is a city called Paris, Texas, USA. It's also very short. I can say, tell me more about it. Okay. Now it's start to say, you know, it's a, a Texas city in Lamar County, and it uh, has twenty six thousand residents, and it's known for its unique claim to the fame. It was once the claim to be the city of Paris due to its resemblance of the French capital. I don't know. I mean, I've been there several times. It's just north of Dallas. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, 
it's a it's a small town, but you know that's uh, but but you can see with this model, it knows a lot more about uh, say the world. It has a lot more knowledge about the world, right? You know, so it's uh, now let's perhaps see something else. You know, let's uh, um, have another example. Let's say if I ask Llama three um, uh, 8B, write me a uh, write me a function in Rust in Rust that determines if an input number is prime. So that's a, you know, a common programming task, right? So you can see it generates text in, uh, in Markdown format and it goes on to, you know, it's a uh, Actually, I think this is really good because that's uh, that is one of the common pro uh, 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 issues that, that that a lot of programmers, human programmers, going to make, right? You know, so it starts with one is false, two is a prime, three, is, and, and then if anything that divisible by two is not a prime, so it already knows that, right? And then it doesn't check all the way to n; it checks to the square root of n, right? You know, so it has uh, several optimization. That's that's that built into that already. So that showcase one of the, uh, if, you have a, if you have a larger model, you, you, it has, really has pretty good programming capability. Now, if I'm gonna say, I'm gonna switch to uh, a smaller model to do a simpler task to translate this to Python. It's gonna do this a lot faster, and uh, you know, because you already have the, the example, so you would be able to do that. And if you just ask the QN model to come up with uh, with the uh, algorithm and the 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 original example and so on, it wouldn't be this good, right? So you know, so that that basically shows you, you know, there's a big trade-off between say the the speed of the model and the size of the model and the knowledge the model have and the 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 capability of the model, right? So we are because of the size of this computer, we are only testing. Um, you know the, the the eight billion parameter model here, but you know if you have a if you have a larger machine, say if you have a um, you know um, a Mac Studio or something like that, you could go I think all the way up e easily to the 70, uh, 70 billion parameter model, right? You know, so that's a, a very simple demo of what this open source project is about. You know, that's uh, um, again. So now I'm going to turn on my Wi-Fi again because I do need Wi-Fi for the for the presentation for the Google Slides. Okay. So we have talked about the um, the uh, see it in action part, okay? So this um, now now people say you know that's um, I I have seen this before, isn't this? You know, there's tools like this. You know, like ARM Studio and you know Jane, and you know there's uh, uh, you know there's a bunch of tools like that. Uh, Olama that allows you to run uh, you know um, uh, models locally. So what's so special about this project? So there's two things about this project. I think that was um, uh, quite interesting. Is that um, you know so. It is pure open source project. So you know, so a lot of those other projects that you talk about, there has closed source components. And the second is that it has a cross-platform UI element to it. So you know, um, and the project itself is uh, roughly divided into two parts. There is one is a front end UI piece, and then it's a back end piece that has an embedded runtime that does um, a model downloads, model management, and model inference, right? You know, so uh, our goal is really to make this not only a useful tool, as you can see later in the roadmap, it's not only become a useful tool for for people to try out large language models, but also becomes a demonstration of how uh, how the uh, you know uh, applications with embedded AI inference can be written, right? You know, so um, one of the goals of this um, this um, project, or I think one of the uh, roots of this project, is uh, it's Rust for UI development. So one of the idea, uh, you know, when people hear about Rust, one of the, um, the, the the conception they have is that you know um, this is a system language. You're gonna write some kind of infrastructure software, right? You know, that people don't really associate Rust with UI development. And uh, so there's a couple projects that are um, on the path to change that, right? So so one of the projects that's upstream to Moshin is called 
uh, Robius. Robius is, uh, is, uh, is a Rust framework for multi-platform application development in Rust. So meaning that um, it's designed to be compiled into native applications that I've just shown, you know, not uh, infrastructure software that is uh, running on the background or, you know, or some kind of web application. But it's, uh, it's, um, so the goal is really to develop um, fully native application um, in Rust and, dis uh, and distribute those applications. So this is one of the projects that Moshin is, um, is based on, right? So the goal really is that um, to create an application development platform in pure Rust because um, as we know, you know, Rust is one of the languages that's, um, you know, that is very robust and safe and uh, uh, more importantly, it's, it, it's a language a lot of people love, you know, so it's, um, I think, you know, there's um, a lot of debate you can have about, you know, which programming language is better, which programming language reigns supreme, right? And, uh, um, you know, I think it's all boils down to how passionate the community is. If you look at uh, the early days of Java, even, you know, that's, uh, um, um, people have this question, you know, why do you need Java? You know, that's because at the time, if you develop web application, don't you have a Perl already? You know, if you want to develop, say, you know, Apache applications, you have C++ already, right? You know, so it's, uh, it's, it's early adopters passion for that language. It's the same thing you see in Ruby, in Go, and, you, in, and, and in all those, right? So there's a, um, I think there's a strong desire for people to write not only infrastructure, but also um, application itself, you know, that's um, an impure Rust, right? And the other thing is that we really want to have, um, uh, because we are now in the era of um, 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 a multi-platform UI and multi-platform devices. So we want this to be um, not only in pure Rust, but in, co in cross-platform. So there's no platform-specific code. So we, um, we're gonna see that in a minute, which means to abstract away the things, um, common things that different operating systems do. So for instance, uh, notification, system notification, uh, how do you get location services, and you know, things like that. Each operating system has different ways to do that, and we want to abstract away those differences. And one of the most important thing to abstract away is GPU access, right? You know, so that's also one of the, uh, the, the talk we're gonna talk about tomorrow um, with, the, with the Docker keynote, right? He, you know, is that once I write application, it should run on the Mac and run on a uh, NVIDIA device on the server. You know, it shouldn't, I shouldn't have to rewrite the GPU code in CUDA and in Metal all over again, right? You know, so, so, you know, so to provide this type of abstraction, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's important. So, you know, um, and we also want native and lightweight UI components available in Rust as well. So, you know, there's a, um, you know, there's a famous quote, you know, that's, uh, um, I just uh, leave it there. Someone said, you know, um, uh, you know, AGI will be built with Python. Let that sink in, you know. I know a lot of pe people here probably love Python, but, you know, um, um, also a lot of system pro um, uh, application developers would think Python would be the wrong language to use for a lot, of, um, for, uh, you know, highly available systems. But in, anyway, so, you know, so this is, um, uh, uh, a part of the drivers why we um, why we created the the, the, the motion project right and uh, so the UI framework um, the application framework is Rubius and uh, the UI framework is, is called is a, is a, is a rust based native UI framework called makepad and it has uh, rust components that can be compiled and rendered uh, so it, it doesn't really depend on you know it's not like electron or you know um, uh, those cross-platform UI framework where it's, uh, it depends on the, on the embedded browser to render a JavaScript or CSS UI, right? So um, a Makepad has all native UI. So, you know, so it has a lot of UI components that uh, render and look natively on the, um, on, on the device you run up, right? And one of the uh, other interesting thing about Rust, this is, um, I think this is the last slide about Rust, is, uh, um, is a thread-safe communication. Because um, you know, when people talk about Rust, they also think about they always think about memory safety, right? Because there's ownership and all that. But the same same concept can be applied to thread safety. So you know, uh, which thread owns the data and which um, how the data was communicated. You know, there's a famous saying. I think that's from the Go community. Is not to say uh, not to share state, so sh uh, not to pass messages through shared memory, but uh, uh, you know. Um, what? But share memories to pass. But share memories to messages, right? You know. So this is one. Uh, 
is one of the things that's uh, perfectly reflected in the, in, in the Rust community, because in the Rust, it's really hard to share memory, because me all the memory has ownership. However, it is easy to pass messages. So there's a, uh, uh, there's a whole uh, standard language library that calls channels that allows you to um, uh, uh, define a data structure that you can pass between threads. Uh, in, uh, in our case, there's, because we have a we have a nice separation between the front end UI elements and the back end AI inference elements. So you know, so the the um, the uh, interaction you just saw on the UI when I ask a question, get some response in a streaming format, is all done through the um, through what we call um, um, thread safe communication through uh, you know um, natively in this Rust application, right? So. That's one aspect of it, right? You know, that's um, um, what um, you know. Um, the Rust-based UI, Rust-based cross-platform UI that we want for machine, and the second aspect of it, which is what we call the, the back end of the the, the the machine application, is the large language model inference aspect. And uh, perhaps this is more interesting to this audience, right? You know, so that's how how we did that. So the first question we have to ask is, what? Uh, sorry, I, I probably should just, uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> I forgot to turn the, the, the full screen mode. So why don't you just use Python or PyTorch? You know, that's, um, uh, you know, I know there's, um, because all those models are published in PyTorch format. However, um, I would argue that PyTorch is really difficult to embed because, you know, if you think about, um, you know, because for application like this, we just want people to download Say an image, and then double click it and install it, and that's it, right? You know, if you have to install a Python environment and all the dependency in it, and you have to take care of things like Conda and you know things, it's difficult enough to install one version of Python on your computer. You know, if you have multiple versions of PyTorch, I think that's be a real headache, right? You know, and if you think about the dependencies of Python, that's um, uh, especially in the GPU environment, you know, the the standard PyTorch image um, on Docker Hub is uh, is uh, is 3.5 gigabytes, you know. Do you know what's in there? You know, that's, uh, it's just a lot of stuff that is dependent, on, right? So I think Python is great for, um, for research and for uh, experimentation and then for um, uh, develop applications that are, you know, um, um, in my opinion, that's a, that's a research in nature, right? But um, for, for uh, uh, you know, a desktop application like machine, I think it's really difficult to use Python because Python, you would have to provide instruction for the user to install Python and PyTorch themselves and uh, um, have to deal with all the driver issues and all the conflict issues that they may have, right? Because it's really difficult to embed the whole thing into your application. So we uh, ruled out Py uh, you know, using Python um, uh, very early on. So then, that's uh, then the next question is why don't you just uh, choose a C++ based framework like Llama.cpp or C based framework, and use the Rust FFI to uh, to interrupt with that framework, right? So the challenge here really is that you know um, if you do that, Llama.cpp, as its name implies, it only deals with large language model, and it's originally only deals with the large language model in the Llama architecture, right? So, and also because it's, a C, it's cross platform C, so it has a very uh, complex build infrastructure. So, in order to in incorporate those C code in your own application, you would have to um, take the multi platform build system with you. And that's a lot of maintenance, that's a lot of work, right? So, um, and you still need to write substantial code in order to manage the things that go with the model. So for instance, you want to assign contact lens with the model depending on how much memory you have. You want to apply a chat template. You want to do two calling. We're going to talk about that, those use cases in a minute, right? You know. So, but, but like we said, Llama.cvp is just one of the competing Llama, uh, large language model runtimes. It runs well on the CPU. It runs well on the Mac. However, you know, on a lot of other devices, it may not be the ideal runtime. So for instance, on the new generation of Intel CPUs, it is not the best runtime for that. You know, uh, Intel itself has ones that can much better use the AVX um, you know, elements or, a or AMX elements that's, that's available on those CPUs, right? You know, so, so, you know, so it's a, um, we want to provide flexibility and not be tied with a specific runtime. So we want the run, you know, um, our application to be able to leverage different runtimes including different large language model runtimes and also uh, AI runtimes, model runtimes that are not um, limited to the large language model so that 
we can have a rich UI that you know, uh, allows one large language model to generate a prompt and then stable diffusion model to generate the image and have that image come back onto the, onto the, um, onto the UI, right? So that's why we are not um, are using one of the um, you know, uh, C++-based runtimes directly. And uh, so the choice we end up making is that you know, we, we, um, you know, that's also um, um, my direct involvement with this project, is that we use WebAssembly as an AI um, runtime. You know, so uh, at a service, it sounds kind of uh, strange. You know, that's, um, you know, why would you use WebAssembly for, um, you know, isn't that something for the browser? You know, why, why would you use it from AI? But it turns out it has some really nice, um, um, you know, features. As you can see, you know, from the demo that I did, um, you know, at first, it runs really fast. You know, so it's, uh, there's, um, you know, it runs, at full native GPU speed on the uh, on the machine, right? You know, so not only it has this um, you know um, uh, you know uh, uh, performance advantage, but it's also WebAssembly has always been one of the uh, the promise of WebAssembly at least is language agnostic, meaning that you can have any language that compiled to the LLM um, you know um, uh, intermediate format to be compiled into WebAssembly on the back end. So you know, so um, not only we can support Rust, we got be, be able to support say uh, Go and the JavaScript, Python, and all those languages. You know, so it's uh, it has it allows any language to you can write AI inference code any language. In the machine's case, we just happen to do it in Rust, right? And it has near native performance. It port it's binary portable across CPUs and GPUs, meaning that as as long as you have the correct driver installed, the same WebAssembly runtime, the same WebAssembly application can be moved around in different um, in, 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 in in different environments. So for instance, I can have a WASM file that's packaged into a Docker image, and it would be able to, to be distributed and orchestrated by Kubernetes without knowing what the underlying GPU or CPU would be, right? So, you know, so um, it has a standard AI inference uh, API. It's called WASI, WASI Neural Network. It's, a, um, but also very interesting is because it sets between the language at the top and the AI runtime at the bottom. So it doesn't have to use Lama.cpp or any particular one kind of um, uh, AI runtime, it can actually be hot swapped for different AI runtimes. So you know, so we, um, so um, with WebAssembly uh, um, uh, in the middle, you can have stable diffusion on the back end or Lama at the back end, you know, something else, right? You know, so it is a very flexible runtime, and um, so. The particular WebAssembly framework that we use is called Llama Edge because for this project we still use uh, large language model is very important, right? So you know, so just to, to be very quickly, you know, it's uh, support different popular large language models, meaning that it supports tasks that are associated with running those m models. So uh, in order to generate the metrics that can go into the model runtime, you need to encode, decode, you need to tokenize, you need to apply prompt templates and all that stuff. So all those are available as um, as open source libraries in Llama Edge, you know, so you can have Rust and other languages implementation of that and compile that in WebAssembly, right? And it supports alternative runtimes for hardware op optimization. So for instance, on Intel, it's, uh, on Intel CPUs, it uses Intel, it, it supports the Intel runtime. On NVIDIA, you know, uh, more advanced NVIDIA devices, it to support Tensor RT. And on, um, you know, newer Mac devices, it is support MLX instead of the Metal framework, right? You know, so there's lots of choices where you can have, um, uh, where, uh, where you can optimize this stuff. And it also, um, like I said, support non-large non language model alternatives like stable diffusion and all that. So I'll go faster. So, you know, so um, when people will say, you know, exactly what do you guys do when you say that you need a framework on top of the large language model, this is what we are talking about. You know, so when you ask a question about, say, where's Paris, it actually needs something that transform that into uh, a specific format that the model can understand, right? You know, so this format is for uh, Llama 3, right? You know, so you have a system from, um, prompt that to say, you know, that's, um, you know, you are helpful AI assistant, whatever, right? You know, where is the French capital? And, and the, so the question and answer, question and answer is all structured in a very specific format. And if you go to the Cuban model, it is an entirely different set of formats. You know, it's, uh, it's the same text, it's the same conversation. But, you know, now you have where you put your system format, how you organize this thing together, you know. So those are the things that are very model dependent. So the model inference framework would have to handle that. So you would have to have, you know, in, Py in, in PyTorch, you would have different libraries to handle that. In, um, you know, so um, on Llama Edge and on Llama.cpp, it's all the same. You know, that's, uh, you would, uh, um, 
uh, someone needs to write this piece of code in order to in order to manage how the model was um, was uh, was processed and dealt with in the in the system, right? You know, so. Then finally, you know, that's uh, um, as you can see, the the the, the machine application has a capability to browse and uh, download those models. So where does that information come from? That uh, we actually use GitHub to um, to manage this information. So we have a GitHub repository called Model Cards, and uh, um, we do want to enhance this uh, Model Cards in the future to have you know performance metrics and you know things like that. So right now it has uh, um, I think some of the nice features. So for instance, it provides uh, download links depending on where you are, you know. So say if you are, um, you know, in the U.S. or in Europe, I think hugging face, a hugging face link would be great. However, if you are in China, you know, that's uh, uh, both GitHub and hugging face are banned. So, so you know, you would have uh, you would have to have local download links. So you know, that's uh, um, you know, so there's lots of nuance that we can, you know, uh, options that we can put into the model cards, and we can also put in, in the, the the prompt template as as I've just shown, and also you know the the, the context size, and you know there, there's there are lots of parameters you can put into the model cards, and uh, um, we want this to be a more collaborative efforts, you know, so uh, when people want uh, to run certain models, they can submit a PR to say add this model support into the model card so that it automatically uh, appear in the machine application so that everybody can would be able to uh, download and 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 run those right. So there's a lot more play in the future. So uh, we want to improve the chat UI. As you can see, the chat UI is fairly simplistic at this moment. It uh, it renders uh, the markdown format, but we want to do a lot better. We want to do syntax highlighting and you know things like that. So copy directly copy and paste of code and you know things like that, right? We want to support. Um, a uh, rag and external data sources, meaning that's in the in the in the local layer, we won't be able to um, uh, the ability to connect to a vector database or a knowledge base of some sort, right? We want to support function calling, you know, so that you know um, in the application, people would be able to configure, you know, what are the um, available functions locally on your machine, so that uh, this uh, so that this computer uh, so that this thing cannot, you know, can. It's more like uh, you know uh, what uh, Apple and Microsoft has has shown in the past. You know those AI PC, where you know you would have um, a local functions that are available on this machine that can be registered into this application, and be, that's the benefit of na fully native applications that the web application would never be able to do. Right. So you know so when the model um, you know when you pump the model in a certain ways, come back with a with uh, with uh, with response formatted in certain JSON formats, and it will be able to uh, you know the, the application would be able to detect that, and then call the function on your machine, right? You know, that's uh, uh, to do something like speak to you, you know, something like that, right? And uh, we also wanted to work, to make it work better with SaaS-based APIs so that, you know, um, allow people to also choose from, say, uh, the Mistral or Open uh, OpenAI APIs if they, if they want to, you know, if they have the, um, you know, to compare it with the, their, their local models, for instance. You know, we also want, obviously, like we talked about, we want multi-model and other types of models, for instance, you know, not just the language model, but uh, generating models for images and, and, you know, speech and, you know, things like that. And uh, one of the other things that are on my wish list is that maybe you can support a server mode. That's, you know, in, so with this application running on my machine, I could have start a peer-to-peer -peer server that can, you know, that can communicate with other people in this room, that we can uh, share our models, because I only have 16 gig of memory. That's I can only one run two model, and if, if we pull together all our laptops, we can run a lot more models, right? You know, so so you know, so those are uh, some of the future plans. Like I, this uh, completely open source project. We have a um, a, a, a team of I think collaborator, I, 20, 30 collaborators already. You know, so it's uh, so um, again the, the the GitHub URL is here, and uh, um, you know, um, if you are interested, we'd love to uh, see you in the discussion forums and. Uh, um, you know, um, uh, you know, raise a issue, raise a PR. You know, that's uh, um, yeah. And the download of the software, you you can find the software in a, in 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 the release section. So download the software and play with it. Yeah. So um, I think I'm over time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I'll hang around here. So if you have a question, feel free to ask. But you know, if you, uh, if you want to talk afterwards, I, I I'm gonna be here for. Them. Um, difference between Makepad and what? So. It's like a Rust framework for um, UI. 
Oh, okay. Yes, since I haven't heard that, so I, so I probably can't answer very intelligently. So but, Yeah, I think I think MakePad is also fairly popular. I think um, you know one of the things you know there are several um, Rust-based uh, UI framework out there, right? You know, but I think um, uh, like Electron, some of them are uh, Rust wrappers around a browser engine. You know, uh, the benefit of that really is that you can use JavaScript or CSS to develop your UI. But the downside really is that they are huge, and the, the, um, you know that's. People's common complaint about you know electron-based app because they have a, you have a Chrome browser that's that's embedded in there, right? In the Rust world, it's mostly Silver. You know that's the 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 um, Mozilla browser engine that's also written in Rust, right? You know so, but I, I'm not really familiar with the one that's the specific one that you are talking about. But MakePad, I think, um, but you know. For Rubyus and for Moshin, I think we, our goal is to work with multiple front ends as well. You know, so we are what we are mostly interested in is the application aspect of it, meaning how to interact with the operating system, not necessarily the UI itself, because the UI is the whole thing on itself. So we want to be able to use the large language model to interact with the operating system. I think that is uh, one of the, 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 the key thing we want to do. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, do you know that if there is al already GPU support from uh, Mac, Linux, or any other platform? Yeah. So, uh, so the question is, uh, using Wasm as a uh, uh, as an inference engine, do we have GPU support, right? Um, the demo I showed, I think it's very clearly showed that it has, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, on the Mac, if I don't have GPU support, it wouldn't answer my question in an instant. It, you, you're going to wait and wait and wait, and it's going to come out one, one word at a time. You know? So, so um, yes, so um, the way it works is Wasm is sort of like Python. You know, if you think about Python, does Python have GPU support? It doesn't. You know, it's the underlying library. It's Torch has GPU support, right? You know, the Python is just... Uh, a layer that's on top of it. Wasm is very similar to that. You know, so it's a, it has a compatibility layer that sits between multiple programming languages and multiple runtimes. So you know, it's um, um, if it runs on the Mac, it knows to call the Metal framework to do the inference. If it runs on the NVIDIA device, it knows to call the CUDA API to do the inference. So it doesn't do the inference in Wasm. It yeah. dispatches that into the GPU to do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, please. I noticed that the whole context switched mm -hmm. in the conversation. Does that limit the context window at all? Is it, I guess it has to retranslate everything. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's, um, that's a great question. So, so the question is, uh, what if I have a really long conversation? You know, that's uh, um, because the context window is, is fixed, right? You know, so that's why we say you can't just use um, simplistic inference solutions where you dump everything to the to the same, you know. Um, so one of the things, you, you know, people ask, you know, exactly what do you guys do, you know, in say in Lama Edge or in Wasm. Is one of the things is to manage that context window, right? You know. So there's many things you can do with the context. For for instance, if the conversation gets too long, then you start to remove the earlier part of the conversation because the later part will be most relevant. But there are people who have a lot of other techniques, so they can put, store the entire conversation into a vector database, and depending on the latest question, it's. Re Extracts the latest, the, the relevant parts of the conversation to the to the model, right? You know, so you can do a lot of those. That's um, one of the uh, uh, I think more interesting aspect of application development. So we actually do that, but right now we are um, the first choice. You know, that's just to forget the early <laughs> early conversation we need to get long. So yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, I think the best way is just to, to go try it. You know, that's, um, um, you know, it's, well, you know, if you download the model from this conference Wi-Fi, you may crash it. So, you know, go back to your hotel to do it. Because the model is like five gigabytes, right? You know, the, the Lama 3 model, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>